Hello everyone and welcome to the 2022 Tyndall Lecture. My name is Fiona Longmere and I'm the Learning and Skills Manager here at the Institute of Physics in Ireland. The Tyndall Lecture series began in 1978 with a talk on the physics of music and since then it's been helping students connect the physics they learn in their classrooms to the world around them. We know that this generation of students has the capacity to change the world. From poverty and pollution to healthcare and climate change, young people are well aware of the challenges that are facing us and you are making your voices heard. Physics can give you the skills to solve complicated problems like these. Not just in theory, not just on paper, but in the real world where there are a whole lot of complicated problems that need solving. Physics is everywhere around us, from the largest things possible to the smallest things imaginable and just about everything in between. And if our world is made up of physics, understanding physics could be the key to shaping that world. To tell us more, I'm delighted to introduce our 2022 Tyndall lecturer, author, rapper and science communicator extraordinaire, John Chase. Thank you, and a big thank you to everybody at the IOP for having me down here for the Tyndall Lecture 2022. My name's John Chase, and this is A World of Physics. So who am I? Uh, so basically, I'm a science communicator. I'm somebody who talks about science and tries to form links between people who do science and research and people who don't. Basically, it's a general public or basically non-specialists. And I do it in different ways. I do shows, I do workshops. You might see me on stage, you might see me on television, you might even see me on YouTube doing uh, science videos um, or even doing science raps, which is something that I uh, specialize in. And you'll be hearing some of those science raps today. Um, I've also co-written a few books um, looking at the science within and behind some of the great movies that you might see and watch. So, for example, the science of Star Wars, the science of Harry Potter, and the science of Jurassic World. But today, it's all about physics. Now, as a kid, I wondered about everything. I had so many questions, and I just wanted the answers. Um, I basically needed to study the nature around me. Now, people who study nature are called scientists. Um, and what they do is science. Now, science is, isn't just looking at the world around us. It's a matter of observing it and doing experiments and testing uh, the things around us and finding different techniques and ways to do that in a structured um, and uh, in a structured way, basically. Um, and a particular type of science um, that looks at a particular type of uh, interaction in the world is called physics. And physics is basically the branch of science that's concerned with the nature and properties of matter and energy. And as you all know, there's also biology and chemistry, but today it's all about physics. So how does physics unlock a world of wonder for you, I, and everybody on this planet? Well, a good question would be, what is everything made from? You see, physics and science helps us to answer so many different questions. So what is everything made from? Well, a simple answer would be stuff. Well, yeah, I know it's a bit simple. So uh, another, way say, another way of saying it is matter. The scientists like to say everything is made of matter. Now, a long time ago, for example, the ancient Greeks, they had an idea. Um, there's a guy called Empodocles, and he thought, you know, everything could be uh, made of different combinations of earth, water, air, and fire. Now, that might sound like it makes a bit of sense, or it might sound a bit weird now, um, but then, Everyone was with it. They were like, yeah, that's a great idea. Now I say different people around the world had their different ideas, but in ancient Greece, this was a going idea. And there was even a guy called Aristotle who added to this and he thought, well, that makes sense, but I think there's another thing we need to describe, a fifth element. Um, and we need to talk about the stuff that's beyond, the stuff that's up in space, the void. Um, and he called that stuff the quintessence, or he also called it ether. OK, so those are the five elements of which everything was made from. But there were other thinkers at the time who thought other stuff. For example, there was a guy called Democritus, and he was like, you know, if you broke everything down to the smallest parts, you would get to the smallest stuff that can't be broken up or divided at all again. It's uncuttable. Um, and the word he gave to that was atomos. OK, and atomos basically means uncuttable or indivisible. And so... That's where we get the word atom from, the idea that everything can be broken down into these things that can't be divided or broken down anymore. But we now know that the atoms, the things that everything's made from and the things we call atoms now, 
can actually be divided up into smaller parts. And the first thing we know is this, that it can be broken down into a particle called an electron. An electron is a negative particle. It's got a negative charge. And we discovered that not only is there an electron in an atom, there is also a positive part in a really in the center called a nucleus. And this positive part isn't just one positive thing. It's actually a bunch of different things. Uh, particles called protons and neutrons, and they live in a nucleus. Now, for an idea of how big the nucleus is, if the nucleus was the size of an apple, the electron would be like a kilometer away, which means that every atom joins together to make all the stuff around us is actually mostly empty space. It's actually 99.9% .9 space. That means me, you, and everything around us is mostly space, okay? So when we look at that, the nucleus and we find that positive part called a proton, when we look at that closely, we realize that every different atom has a different number of protons, and we recognize the atom by the number of protons. One proton means it's hydrogen. Two protons means it's helium. And we can go on like that up to about 118 protons. And that's what we believe everything is made of. These atoms that are actually divisible, uh, there are 118 different atoms, and they're put together in different ways to create everything around us, all the stuff that makes the matter that we're aware of. Now, there is something called dark matter. And funnily enough, you may or may not know this, but all of the normal matter, the stuff that we've just been talking about, is only about 5% of all the stuff that they believe is out there in the universe, okay? They think there's dark energy and dark matter as well. But we're just talking about the normal matter, okay? So that, that 5%. And all of that can be described by these 118 elements. So where did all this stuff come from? Well, we now know it started in a big bang. Okay, physics has worked that out. We've rolled back the observations of space and everything going apart to realize that it was all closer together in a point smaller than a full stop. All of the energy of the universe compressed into that tiny space. And at some point it expanded just under 14 billion years ago. And we call that point the big bang. And within a second, all of that energy had compressed, uh, had cooled down and started to form the earliest particles. And eventually we had our first protons and neutrons within the first second. And then within three minutes after the Big Bang, we had the first nuclei, the first centers of atoms called a nucleus, not with the electron, with the electron gone and just kind of floating around in space doing their own thing, just wandering around. But you could kind of imagine a nucleus like the flowers and the electrons like bumblebees kind of floating around everywhere. But at some point, 300,000 years or 370,000 years after the Big Bang, space and energy had cooled down enough and started spread it out and cooled down enough to start having electrons combined to those nuclei, to the nucleuses, to create the first atoms. And these were mostly hydrogen and helium. And in fact, now, most of space, in fact, everything, most of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen and helium. 74% of them are hydrogen, about 24% of helium, and then 2% of everything else in the universe of the normal matter is all the other elements, okay? And in fact, 1% is carbon and half a percent is oxygen. So there's only like 0.5% of the universe, which is everything else, all right? Now that hydrogen and helium floats around in like uh, big clouds of gas and dust, okay? And over time, they start to get attracted through gravity. And at some point they start to really push together and they start combining under pressure and the heat and you start fusing the nuclei together. And that gives off a bit of energy. Now that happening over billions and billions and billions of times gives us so much energy that we start to see it as heat and light. That is the beginning of the first stars. Now hydrogen and helium was mostly made in the big bang in a point called, we call that nucleosynthesis of all these atoms. But all the other atoms beyond lithium, so lithium and beyond, um, were mostly basically built in stars, okay? Um, now, to get an idea of that, I suppose we should maybe talk about how stars form. So instead of me describing it, I think I should move to my first rap. This is a star formation rap, and it's about the life cycle of stars and talks about how they form from a big cloud of dust and gas and how they enter the main part of their life called the main sequence when they start giving off light um, and then how they end their life um, as a red giant, a super red giant, or even perhaps a black hole. So check out this star formation rap.
It starts as a big cloud of dust and gas, but then the gravity takes over and it starts to contract. The gases are squeezed together as the masses attract to make the core get hotter from the steady collapse. The hot gases expand with an outward pressure that can balance the gravity that's holding the star together. Then at a certain temperature, the core starts to enter into a nuclear fusion of hydrogen at the center. They shine like beacons and are in the main sequence. The larger the mass, the more energy they're releasing. But as the core's depleting, all the hydrogen it's keeping, the pressure pushing outward from the core begins to weaken. Gravity takes over now beginning to squeeze The core swings under the weight Thus increasing the heat For nine tenths of its life The main sequence has been its main home Now it's growing and it's ready to leave A low mass star can become a red giant Then a planetary nebula is next in line Where you find a white dwarf that was left behind Before dimming into a black dwarf over time You get a red super giant from a star that's large A supernova marks death of these larger stars To leave a neutron star in the aftermath And if not, a black hole is thought to end their path so let's continue on our journey okay so what is the smallest stuff out there so if atoms are divisible but things like electrons can't be divided what 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 is the smallest stuff that we can find so here is that atom again okay and we've got the nucleus in the in the center with the red and blue purple things that's the protons and the neutrons okay this particular one would be helium um that big fuzzy area around it is where the electrons kind of live and you don't know exactly where they are they kind of anywhere they kind of live in a they could be here they could be there but we know they're there moving around and generally um the stable atom has the same amount of electrons as it does protons now, electrons can't be divided up any further. We call them a fundamental particle or elementary particle, okay? But the protons and neutrons can be divided up. Inside a proton, you've got these things called quarks, two up and one down. And inside the neutron, you've got two down and one up, okay? Now, quarks are indivisible. As far as we know, we can't divide them any smaller. So they're elementary particles. And there's a bunch of elementary particles that physics has become aware of. For example, you can see the six purple quarks. So the up and down ones that are in a proton and neutron, but you also have charm, strange, top and bottom. And you have other particles like the electron. And you've got heavier versions of that called muon and tau. And you've also got neutrinos. And you can see them all down in the bottom left as leptons. And then you have other particles, for example, the W boson, the Z boson, um, the gluon, which is the squiggly line that you can see uh, in the proton and neutron that's connected in the force that's holding together the, the quarks in the proton and neutron. And you've also got photons, which is basically light. And then I'll come back to light in a bit. And we've also recently discovered a Higgs boson, which is responsible for giving all of the particles mass, as far as we know. So scientists uh, probe matter. They probe the stuff of what the universe is made of to find out more about it. And ways to do that is they can take particles, speed them up, accelerate them in these things called particle accelerators, and then they send them down these paths and collide them into each other, okay? Now, in this image, you can see the path of the Large Hadron Collider, and that is a particle accelerator. Now, there are about 30,000 different particle accelerators in the world in use today, not all as big as this, but all of them uh, smash particles together or accelerate particles to be used in different ways. This particular one, though, is used to probe the very smallest elements of matter. Now, they send them down these tubes, like you see in the bottom right, in different directions, boost them up and accelerate them to high energies, then they collide them, they turn into pure energy, then as they cool down again, they start to form all these particles that are released around them. Now, to detect those particles, scientists have to build these huge detectors, okay? Now, these detectors cost loads of money, and you can see the man at the bottom how big this is, just to detect the smallest particles of matter. Now, this is a good example of how science isn't just about the stuff you do and the things you look into. It's also the tools, the things you have to build and engineer to actually probe the very fundamentals of matter and nature. So it's not just the science itself, it's the instruments we need to create. And all of those involve physics. Now, another interesting question is, where does light come from? Now, I find this interesting because I always wondered, what is light and where does it come from? And how did it get here? And you can understand the ancient Greeks would have said, oh, you know, it's got to do with the fire element. It's just the stuff of fire. But here you can see a picture on the left, okay? Now, that represents an atom. It's not exactly how we think atoms look like, but it's just an idea to understand what's going on inside the atom. In the center, you have the nucleus, then you have these different circles. Now, 
in the, around the center, the nucleus, you have electrons that are kind of somewhere around, but they have their most relaxed kind of chilled state, okay? Now that chilled state is where they're at rest, okay? Now, if you give it energy, they can jump up to a more excited state and they can jump up, depending on how much energy you give them, they can jump up a particular amount, okay? Now, when it goes up, it's said to be in an excited state, but then it like to drop back down to its stable state again. And when it drops back down to any other state below, so in this picture, you could see it could be at three and doctor two. When it does that, it gives off a bit of energy. It gets rid of that extra energy it had. And that energy is released as a photon, light, okay? Now that photon is a bit weird because it doesn't just travel as a particle. It can be a particle and a wave at the same time. Huh? Yeah, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Now, this has uh, got to do with uh, quantum physics is, is, is somewhere where if you want to learn more about this, look into quantum physics. But how can something be both a wave and a particle at the same time? Well, look at this picture. You can see it says light is a wave or light is a particle. Well, it kind of says both at the same time. So the thing is, it just depends on the context and how you're looking at it or how you're measuring it. And that's what happens if the with the photon depending on how you measure it it can seem to be a wave or it can be a particle so that's just a weird aspect of light okay and this particular particles now uh, that is where light comes from it comes from electrons falling from an excited state and giving off light whether it's in the sun whether it's in a torch whether it's in a light whether it's in a flame there are electrons that have been excited then relax back down and given off light and depending on how much energy they've given off that light will have a different appearance, okay? Now, if it's given off light or energy in a frequency, uh, in a particular frequency, say between a wavelength of 380 or 750, then we've got what we call visible light, okay? So these are photons with an energy that create the light of all the colors of the rainbow. Now, that is only one tiny part of the full range of different types of light that's out there, okay? And we call it the spectrum and the spectrum of light. Now, they call light electromagnetic radiation, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But for now, you just got to see it as all the spectrum of light is beyond the visible. You can also go into infrared and beyond, or you can go to shorter wavelengths or higher frequencies, higher energies, in the other direction to go towards gamma rays. And instead of me just talking about this, I've got another rap. This rap is all about the light frequencies uh, and the spectrum of light. Now, all it leaves for me to do is wave goodbye. It starts in the radio waves with a lower frequency than the microwaves that come next. As we step over the infrared to find Richard of York, give him battle in vain, but don't fret. That's a mnemonic with the visible spectrum that blends into ultraviolet radiation. Then X rays come at increased frequencies with the gamma rays taking up the highest energies. That's right. So, that was just a quick summary of the electromagnetic spectrum. In rap, of course. Now, when we're talking about light, light can be manipulated in different ways. And so we can uh, bend the light um, using glass or mirror to reflect it. And when we reflect it, we can reflect it so it focuses, or we can also put it through glass to make it bend, called refraction. And again, it's to focus the light. And we can use it in microscopes to look at the really small, or we can use it in telescopes to look at the real, really distant. And so these are tools to help us manipulate light, to kind of probe again uh, the, the fundamentals of nature and the world around us. Now, the different frequencies of light, these telescopes don't just work for visible light. We can also develop detectors for different frequencies of light. And we use different frequencies of light in different ways. For example, the lower frequencies, that's the longer wavelengths, we call that radio. And those radio waves are used for sending radio signals and also television. Then when you move up to microwaves, a microwave oven uses microwaves, as does our mobile phone. Um, and then we also have infrared light uh, used on your remote control, visible light as we all see all the colors of the rainbow that our eyes can detect. Then we have ultraviolet light, the stuff that gives you a sunburn, um, x-rays, um, well, to see bones. And then we have gamma rays that's used in, me in the medical world, and also for sterilization of some foods because the gamma rays have so much energy to destroy any type of life that's in there, which is why it's damaging to us, okay? It's really high energy. You can see by the amount of lines, the, the bigger the frequency, uh, the higher the energy. 
So we have telescopes that can see all of these different ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum, but there's a problem. Not all of that light can get through our atmosphere. Some of it gets absorbed by the particles in the atmosphere. So the only light that actually reaches the earth is within an optical window. So maybe visible light and a little bit of ultraviolet, a little bit of infrared. And then we've got to jump again over to the radio waves where we can pick up other signals that can make it through our atmosphere. So if we build a telescope and put it on planet earth, on the surface, we can look at visible light or radio waves. And here is an example of a huge radio telescope. It's called the FAST and it's 500 meters across. Okay, that's 500 meters across. And it's specifically to pick up radio waves, which have long, free, uh, long wavelengths. Okay, and that takes them and focuses them and allows us to look at radio light coming in radio frequencies from outer space. But if we want to look at any of the other types of light, we need to get above the atmosphere. And so even though we can develop telescopes that can detect it, we need to get them into space. And so we need to wait for rockets and technologies to actually get us up there. So again, not only did physics help us detect these things, it helped us to get into space so we could detect even more wavelengths and unlock some of the mysteries of nature and the beginning of the universe. Now, there's another hidden clues that are in light. If you just take light and split it up into its spectrum of visible light, you can do that using a um, tool called a spectrometer. And that splits the light into all of its different colors, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, Richard of York given battle in vain. And you can see in the top right, there's a continuous spectrum as we call it of the light. But something else can happen. If that light was to travel through a gas, a cloud of gas, the particular atoms in that gas with their electrons around them would pick up particular frequencies which would excite the electrons. And when those excited electrons absorb that energy, that, that particular frequency or wavelength doesn't make it through. And so instead of having a continuous spectrum, we get a spectrum with bits that have been absorbed out of it and you get these black lines. That's called an absorption spectrum. And based on that fingerprint, those patterns of blank lines, we can work out what atoms and molecules was in that cloud of gas. And so scientists can use a spectrometer to actually detect what atoms and molecules might exist in a cloud of gas that is without reach, that is beyond our galaxy, beyond our, our star system and way out in the galaxy, okay? Now, not only can we see the light as it goes through, we can also see light that was absorbed and then re-emitted in every direction. So if we're looking at the cloud from the side, we can see some of that emitted light. And because it's of a particular frequency, that's the only frequencies we see. And we see in the bottom left, the emission spectrum. That's the wavelengths, frequencies of light that were emitted by the atoms. And again, because we know what uh, energy levels though those emitted photons correspond to, we can work out what molecules or atoms was in that cloud again, okay? So that's absorption spectrums, emission spectrums, continuous spectrums. And it's so cool that they can even look through the atmosphere of a planet around another star, okay? And as the starlight escapes and goes through the atmosphere of that planet, we can see the absorption spectrum and work out what the atmosphere of that distant planet around a distant star may be composed of. Boom. That's right. <laughs> okay, now, funnily enough, we looked at the sun a while back and when we looked at the sun, we saw that there were some lines missing and we didn't know what molecule or atom that was. And so they said, this a new atom, we'll name it after the sun, after the Greek name, uh, the ancient Greek god of the sun called Helios. And they named that element helium. So we discovered helium on the sun before we even knew what it particularly was, okay? And so helium has got its name because of it's what we found in the sun. Now, speaking of the sun, here is a rap about the light when it leaves the sun to travel to the outer solar system.
sunsets at the centre, sending out photons that enter into interactions with matter, getting absorbed or scattered. When it penetrates the atmosphere of the surrounding planet, it can stimulate the weather or adversely cause it damage. The type of radiation that escapes the solar surface is transmitted in more frequencies than BBC's got purchased. Use electricity and radio waves for the purpose of uncovering a few hidden permutations of the universe. Heat with microwaves and use infrared for the night search. Eyes of to converge on what visible light disturbs. People sit out in the sun all day, get burned and start to curse. But if the world was any closer, the consequences would be worse. It takes about eight minutes for the light to reach the earth. At 300 million meters per second, the lint dispersed. Through a vacuum, watch electromagnetic radiation disperse. Getting weaker as we increase the distance that it has traversed. But now to move out to a radius that's even further past an asteroid flow of carbon and silicon boulders. Travel past the moon to Jupiter and decrease in size order. First was Ganymede, then Callisto, next Io, then Europa. Through a telescope, we note the movements of the many moons. In amongst the rings of Saturn, Uranus, and even Neptune. But most of space is empty, like Mary Antoinette said, until we filter frequencies decapitating light spectrums. And now the final mentions to the outer solar system, where light has traveled 50 times the Earth to solar distance. In the region known as Kuiper, where comets wait for deliverance. And light has traveled seven hours just to grace their presence. But that's only a step towards the interstellar freezer. The Oort cloud is the edge, and that's a thousand times. Deeper in a cometary playground where the gold is from a cipher, it's the kind of place that you should look to find the or Kuiper. So here's another question. What causes the weather? Now, uh, simple answer is it's the sun. But I never really knew that at first. But we're all aware of the water cycle, okay? And you may be aware that the sunlight comes down, it heats up the water molecules, and it causes them to gain energy and change from a liquid to a gas. And when that happens, we say it has evaporated. And then it rises because it's less dense, and the more dense air is kind of pushing downwards and causing the less dense to be pushed upwards. And as it goes up, wind blows it across and it also cools down. And as it cools down, it changes from a gas back to droplets of liquid. And we call those clouds. And as those clouds are blown across, they travel across. And then at some point they cool enough. The droplets are basically growing in size and they get too heavy, then they drop from the clouds as rain. Now, if you were to cool the temperature down even more, because it can get really cold up there, um, you get another change of state from a liquid to a solid. It changes the water into ice. And we see that as snow or sleet. And again, when it's warm enough, it runs down due to gravity, it runs down back into the lakes and the rivers, and then again, back into the ocean. Now the wind that blew the clouds across was also caused by the sun, because as the sun heats up the land surface and the water surface, and it's absorbed in the atmosphere, it gets hotter and the atmosphere, the air actually expands, becomes less dense and rises. And the more dense air sinks. And what we end up with is a convection current. And as that convection current the moving hot and cold air moves around, we feel that as wind. So yes, the sun is the driving force for most of the weather we feel. But you know what? There's no point me just talking about it. I've got a rap to summarize the water cycle and the effect of sun and uh, the effect of the precipitation in its different forms. Water pulls out the skies, rain, sleet, hail or snow But who knows why the rules apply The clouds fly in certain formations What determines the types falling over nations Precipitation, water falls out the skies Rain, sleet, hail or snow But who knows why the rules apply The clouds fly in certain formations What determines the types falling over nations 71% of the earth's surface is covered in water Just in case it didn't notice without it All life on earth would be hopeless It travels in a cycle and most of you know this when a sunbeam streams in bringing energy 
some of the water evaporates readily, steadily, heading to a place that is heavily, you're telling me that the sky's the limit, well it better be, the water is vapor, that's in the gas phase, the same amount of water but in a bigger space, that's one of the effects when the temperatures raise, the less dense is raised to the top, the more dense is at the base, as the vapors get higher up, the temperature falls, in the region of the atmosphere where the clouds soar, and the particles of water start to gather like a swarm, till they get so big that we can see them take form, that's condensation, from a vapor to liquid, heavy droplets from a cloud get evicted, many have prayed, suffering, drought afflicted, but no more rain, wondering where it drifted, clouds bring moisture from evaporation, then it condenses onto precipitation, it drops in the highlands, the valleys, all regions, the rivers transmit, the water flows back to oceans, precipitation, water falls out the skies, rain, sleet, hail or snow, but who knows why, the rules apply, the clouds fly in certain formations, what determines the types falling over nations, precipitation, water falls out the skies, rain, sleet, hail or snow, but who knows why, the rules apply, the clouds fly in certain formations, what determines the types falling over nations, the science of the weather man is meteorological, studying the atmosphere that understand the rainfall, so water condenses and drops around particles, forming clouds that are flat and others more vertical, there's many types but remember one, it's cumulonimbus, the ones where the waters come, these types of clouds are responsible for thunderstorms, and when the clouds freeze and it drops sleet or hailstones, hello? Hi Jay, I heard weather warning, uh -huh. so why is it the snow and not the rain that is falling? Well that's a good question Joe, thank you for calling, actually I found the answer just the other morning, so here is the story of a cloud on a cold day, welcome to the wonderful world of the snowflake, if you have an interest, do it for your own sake, and while I explain, please feel free to note take, a light rain where a liquid was caught up, snowflakes form from ice crystals of water, depending on temperature and levels of moisture, some are like needles, but stars are more popular, dropping the symmetry of a six-sided prism, see snowflakes assemble each a little bit differently, they turn water vapour into a solid consistency, and that forms the snowflakes falling from above me, precipitation, water falls out the skies, rain, sleet, hail or snow, but who knows? Why the rules apply, the clouds fly in certain formations What determines the types falling over nations Precipitation, water falls out the skies Rain, sleet, hail or snow But who knows why the rules apply The clouds fly in certain formations What determines the types falling over nations Hello there, a spell of severe, disruptive and potentially treacherous weather It's forecast to spread across the UK in the next 24 hours The Met Office are warning of this It's rare though that they put out a warning of extreme weather But that is what we currently in force this evening overnight tonight and through Monday. So there we have it. So physics helps us understand the weather too. Um, and meteorology is the, the study of the atmosphere, but you also have atmospheric scientists, climate scientists, all different types of scientists exploring it using physics. But can physics help me understand climate change? Of course it can. Okay, so when you think about waves, like light waves coming from the sun, waves, all waves carry energy from one place to another. And when the energy of the sun hits the planet Earth, some of it's absorbed, about 70%, but then 30% of it is reflected. Okay, it's reflected off the clouds and off the surface of the oceans and off the land. Um, but when it's absorbed, this energy is also then re-emitted, sent back out. And, but it's re-emitted as infrared radiation, okay? Now this infrared radiation, although the visible light can make it through okay, and the other types of light, when it's re-emitted as infrared, infrared doesn't make it so, doesn't make it out so happily. It can actually get reabsorbed by what we call the greenhouse gases. And those greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases take in the infrared energy and then re-emit it in all directions. Some of which carry on going up, some of it goes sideways and some of it comes back down to earth. So instead of us generally losing this radiant heat, some of it is actually reflected back down onto the planet earth, creating an additional heat, which we call the greenhouse effect. Now, John Tyndall, uh, who, for which these Tyndall lectures was named after, was really uh, well, he's well into the study of infrared radiation and its effect on gases. That was a big area of his study and research. So it's really cool that actually we can talk about climate change and greenhouse gases because that was John Tyndall's thing, infrared radiation's effect on gases, or one of his things. So we've seen how the greenhouse gases can create a raise in temperature called the greenhouse effect. And we've also measured this temperature and changes on the planet for a number of years, actually, 
Funnily enough, you may or may not know this, but Armagh Observatory and Planetarium has got the longest running river record on the British Isles. That's right. And they also look into many different types of science, and um, particularly physics and astrophysics, to find out all about the wonders of space and the things that happen up there. So don't just take my word for it, because there's a rap that summarizes a lot of the research that they're currently doing there. This is the ARMA Observatory and Planetarium rap by me. We're getting starstruck at AOP, where they regard the stars and the galaxies and supermassive black holes, but we can't avoid a good look at the solar system's asteroids. So come and check it out at the AOP. Observe the universe, there's a lot to see. Come to the planetarium and learn the story. Or research at this observatory. The story begins in 1790 with Archbishop Robinson's observatory. A telescope in Armagh to explore the heavens and it's currently the oldest one in the same set. And the longest daily weather record in the British Isles Began there in 94 and it still survives It's recorded at 9am every day Adding to our understanding of climate change But looking in the sky there were stars to see And strange fuzzy objects now known as galaxies They locked them in the catalogue, the NGC Still used around the world for astronomy Now, as a result of their passion to communicate The planetarium opened in 1968 You might know the first director, Patrick Moore Of the sky at night in sight yours to explore we're getting starstruck at AOP where they regard the stars and the galaxies and supermassive black holes but we can't avoid a good look at the solar system's asteroids so come and check it out at the AOP observe the universe there's a lot to see come to the planetarium and learn the story or research at this observatory at AOP you can learn about research into the sun and its effect on earth what drives the solar wind and magnetic activity or how so of flares could harm life on earth they also stare at the sky for sudden flares of light from stars in our galaxy or other galaxy sites this might help find the source of gravitational waves to help other astronomers to understand how they're made now our galaxy is full of cold gas that stirs under gravity's pull leading to new star birth but the most massive stars can form black holes the phenomena that happens when the star implodes and did you know nearly every galaxy features a supermassive black hole looking at the center it can blow away the gas that could form new stars Preventing the galaxies from getting more vast. We're getting starstruck at AOP, where they regard the stars and the galaxies and supermassive black holes. But we can't avoid a good look at the solar system's asteroids. So come and check it out at the AOP. Observe the universe, there's a lot to see. Come to the planetarium and learn the story. Or research at this observatory. The asteroid belt's got a bunch of boulders. The Kuiper belt's similar, but they're much colder. We call them comets from the outer solar system but some space rocks are closer they're known as trojans you could understand it as if they were sheep and the shepherd is the planet there's thousands of jupiter and one with earth and mars is some the aop as well research they establish what asteroids and comets are made from with telescopes on earth making observations of the way that sunlight reflects back from the surface with special instruments that are built for the purpose there's so much to learn from reflected light but one day it might indicate the presence of life it's been tried with Earth, but that's just the start, cause it can work on exoplanets around other stars. We're getting starstruck at AOP, where they regard the stars and the galaxies and supermassive black holes, but we can't avoid a good look at the solar system's asteroids. So come and check it out at the AOP, observe the universe, there's a lot to see. Come to the planetarium and learn the story, or research at this observatory. Yes, there you go. Now, John Tyndall, he weren't only just interested in light and infrared light and how it was absorbed uh, by different gases. He was also interested in sound. And in fact, he wrote a book called Sound. Um, so the physics of sound is another interesting topic. Now, when you hear about sound waves and light waves, another question is, they're both waves, but how are they different? So if you look at this picture, you can see a lighthouse which would send out light. Um, and also a rainbow where light has been split into its spectrum of colors 
um, by the raindrops. Um, but when we look at a light wave, uh, what is it? Well, it's called an electromagnetic uh, radiation. And the reason they call it that is because if you try to measure what's happening when you've got light, this radiation can be felt or can be perceived or picked up as a change in the magnetic field, that's the B, that's on the Z axis, and also a change in the electric field, that's the blue one, okay, which is the E. And they increase and decrease, they vary at the same rate, okay? And you can see the frequency of which it's varying. And that's why we call it electro an electromagnetic wave, because it's a combination of both a variation in an electric field and a magnetic field. Now, the waves traveling in the X direction and the waves are transverse to that, they're at right angles. And so we call that a transverse wave. Now, light can travel through the vacuum of space. It doesn't need anything to travel through. And it travels at 300 million meters per second. Okay, That's really fast, okay? It can go around the planet Earth seven and a half times in one second. But sound waves are a bit different. If you look at sound waves, even though they can be represented as a wave like that, if you look at the diagram above, you can see that the black dots are particles. And uh, sound needs stuff to travel through. It has to travel through matter, whether it's solid, liquid, gas, or a plasma, okay? Now, as it moves through, it compresses parts of the molecules together or atoms together, the particles, and there's other parts where they're more spread apart. And that represents, where they're closer together represents the peak, where they're further apart represents the trough. And so we can represent that as an oscillating wave, but really, instead of it being transverse, it actually travels like this. We say it's longitudinal because it travels along the direction of the wave that the waves travel in. And when those areas of lots of dense, dense particles and not dense, dense, not dense, dense, not dense, uh, they have different pressures, okay? High, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. When that hits the eardrum, it moves the eardrum, which then translates it into signals that go to our brain and allow us to perceive those pressure changes as sound. Now, those pressure changes, if you make the sound even louder and use, for example, a really bassy speaker, you can see the effect of the sound waves, like this girl's hair. Yeah, that's actually the effect of the bass, the pressure waves moving her whole hair. That's right. That's why you gotta kind of cover your ears and make sure you don't go deaf. But that is how sound travels. Now, sound travels in air at about 343 meters in a second. So that's a lot slower than light. Okay, but how can physics help us to understand music? Well, here's a guitar and the guitar's got a string. And when you pluck the string, the string vibrates, okay? Now, when you have vibrations, you can either get a single vibration, just a up and down where the biggest change in the movement is in the middle and there's one of those. And that is what's called the fundamental frequency, the basic frequency, the lowest frequency at which that naturally wants to wobble or vibrate. But if you double that frequency, you get this whole wavelength, okay? And you get two maximum part places of displacement or two places where the movement is most. And if you triple it, you get three places, okay? And it works in whole numbers and you can keep doing it, increasing the frequency in those whole numbers and you will get these even waves that fit exactly within the distance, okay? And you can see them there. Why does it matter? Because when you think about sound, each different note, for example, on the piano, creates a different pitch and each pitch is related to the frequency. Now we can hear between frequency of 20 Hertz, the 20 cycles a second, and 20,000 cycles a second, or 20,000 20, Hertz, or 20 kilohertz, you also say. And we represent particular frequencies by particular notes. And those notes repeat from C to B, then C to B again. And each time it repeats, we call that an octave, okay? And this is what's used in music. Now, the difference between the notes and two octaves is that the next octave up, it's exactly twice the frequency of the octave below. Let me give you an example. If you look at F, which I've just highlighted, no F, it has a frequency of 22 Hertz, and that's the lowest one. If you double the frequency, you get to the next octave. The next octave up is the next F note, and that's 44 hertz. And then if you go to the next octave up, you can see that it doubles the frequency again to 88 hertz. And you keep, keep doubling it as you go up octaves. So music, the physics of sound, is totally uh, tied up within uh, music and the different sounds that we hear when we play music. Now, uh, here's a little rap to talk about music production and specifically how 
music has now become digitized. We've been able to use that physics of sounds and encode it um, within digital um, systems. By the vibrating of particles that are existing as a solid liquid or gas and if you measure the speed of displacement of the particles you'll be able to tell what frequency the sound has we perceive different frequencies as different tones and pitches up to a certain limit beyond which our hearing fails the frequencies we hear are split into 12 notes that repeat from c to b forming the pitch scales naturally occurring sounds are made from many sine waves each with a different frequency amplitude and phase this means different instruments won't tend to sound the same even if you're matching up the notes that are being played but if a song has many sounds with the same frequencies the frequencies can clash and overcrowd the song severely so to make sure all parts of the song are heard clearly equalization helps to distribute them fairly naturally occurring sounds are like analog signals we can make them digital from mics and audio cables it's an 80 converter that converts analog to digital by sampling the analog signals at discrete intervals the sample rate or number of intervals in a second is giving us a frequency in hertz check the legends the y-axis splits the signals volume into sections determined by how many bits are used in quantization see these work at 16 bits and 44.1 kilohertz storing sounds on computers or even concerts but we can't hear in digital so first we must convert the information back to analog which ears prefer samplers record store and manipulate sound and were a major part of hip-hop as it gathered its ground and when computers improved they helped in pushing out the bounds allowing graphic editing where more precision could be found There we go. So there was a little bit about sound and the physics of sound, okay? And the, the scientific study of sound and its use would be called acoustics, okay? And there's many different uses. Um, you could be a sound engineer, an audio engineer. You can also study how sound moves around the room to make sure the room's designed in a way that you don't get overlapping frequencies, creating sounds that basically sound rubbish. When you've got a symphony and orchestra who's practiced to become really good, you want the sound to be as perfect as possible. So they actually designed the shape of uh, these theatre halls so that the acoustics are balanced. And there's many different ways to explore the use of sounds. You know, it's using architecture, it's using science, uh, psychology to understand the sounds that animals are making as well. It's used to reduce the amount of extra noise coming from machines. It's used in the medical world. Um, it's used for headphones, loudspeakers, concerts, for example. Um, it's used in digital things, for example, streaming, Alexa. Like there's so many different uses and of, of the knowledge of acoustics and the science and the physics behind sound that you could use that knowledge to take on a whole load of different jobs and to change the world in many different ways. Now, talking about the sounds and acoustics, here's another rap about how sound can be digitized to create the naturally occurring sounds you hear around us. Yes, Mr. Reed. So I've explained the basic properties of sound, digital audio, synthesis and MIDI. Is there anything else? Tell them about reverbs and delays. Alright, no problem. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the physics of sound that surrounds natural acoustics. How reverbs and echoes produced in nature get reproduced in music. It's the digital signal processing effects you'll be using. Make unrealistic or real life acoustics suit any surroundings of your choosing. In particular, check the reverb for making ambience. That's the word. As sound gets reflected or absorbed, you can observe a change in the way it's heard. It's direct sound when it first occurs. And early reflections are what first returns. They become reverberations where individuals waves can't be discerned so let's alter the reverb parameters for developing the right ambience changing the levels of early reflections and setting the reverb to the right balance it's also a challenge to choose a decay that matches the space it occupies so a bigger place should have a bigger decay time that's coordinated with the room size when the reflecting surface is far like up in the cave and you're shouting hello the gap in reflections is more apart so you hear a delay which you call an echo delays can give illusions of the movement of any sound's occasion because human hearing has evolved to identify sound's direction There you go. Now, that is the area of the audio engineer, but physics can be used in many different ways. And the idea of how can physics enter the world and make a difference? Well, much of it is through the work of engineers who take the ideas and the physical concepts 
to create things that are needed in our world and make a difference in our everyday lives. So this next rap is all about the influence of engineers on our lives. And imagine what the world would be like if we didn't have engineers making use of all this physics. Go back to when civilization started. Most of the world had yet to be charted. I bet you're glad that the wheel was invented. Part of the earliest in engineering. Add pivots and gears and levers, then ancient weaponry built by Archimedes. The military has changed through the centuries, giving engineers a major role in the armies. Technology provides an advantage, so a lot of the time new discoveries are guarded. But as people started sharing knowledge with each other, the industrial revolution came from steam power. Electricity took away some limitations as the world became smaller through new communications. Now cooperation is the best way forward. With the work of engineers, the future's all good. Imagine if we didn't have engineers If one day we woke up and they all disappeared What then? Well our troubles would multiply The modern world would be struggling to survive No vehicles, no roads, heating or lights No computer systems or internet sites Oh no, you'd be using a pen to write With a book reading under the candlelight Engineers have made transportation Through networks, vehicles and mass automation from the streets to the railway stations, the depths of the sea and even the space station. Everything man-made starts in the mines, but research and development can take a bit of time. So engineers are needed who can do good designs and help bring new ideas to the production lines. Engineers learn how to see things differently, because solving a problem is a daily activity. Applying innovation and true creativity to maintain and improve our public utilities. High visibility, jackets and hard hats And engineering works on the roads and the train tracks It's easy to think they only work with their hands But a lot of engineers are busy working their minds Imagine if we didn't have engineers If one day we woke up and they all disappeared What then? Well our troubles would multiply The modern world would be struggling to survive No vehicles, no roads, heating or lights No computer systems or internet sites Oh no, you'd be using a pen to write With a book reading under the candlelight the ability to design can go pretty far It's the reason that humanity can reach for the stars Putting satellites in space and sending robots to Mars You can get a job at NASA if you're up for the task Engineers improve lives the whole world over By providing better sources of energy and water And we also know inventions can make them famous Like the Clockwork Radio by Trevor Bayliss these days it's amazing to recognise all the many ways engineers are identified, the work specified as being specialised, but overall it's the roles we can emphasise. It's an enterprise where people persevere to produce new technologies by using their flair, so looking for a challenge and an exciting career, consider becoming one of tomorrow's engineers. Imagine if we didn't have engineers If one day we woke up and they all disappeared What then? Well our troubles would multiply The modern world would be struggling to survive No vehicles, no roads, heating or lights No computer systems or internet sites Oh no, you'd be using a pen to write With a book reading under the candlelight So, here we have it We have now come to the end of this talk, a world of physics, with me, John Chase. Now, a world without engineers is one thing. Now, imagine a world without our knowledge of physics, without all the things we've covered here, the age and scale of stuff in the universe, what it's all made of, how it came to be, what distant worlds are like, how the weather works, the development of modern music, and the technologies to discover and delve deeper into the world on the physics of the nature around us. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of so many things we couldn't even fit here in this talk. So I just ask this, look at the world of wonder around you and view it with your eyes wide open. Don't just learn about physics, but try to actually see how that knowledge can help unlock some aspect of the world you weren't aware of before. So go off, enjoy whatever you're doing next. And I hope you now have a further appreciation of how physics and the stuff you're learning at school can make an impact on the world around you and the society you live in. Thank you. <laughs>